means of various fora uh, and uh, engagements, both uh, within the U.S. and, and beyond. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about us, uh, CSOT, which is the acronym that we use, uh, hosts an an or, or yes, hosts an annual uh, artist in residence. We have uh, a distinguished scholar who comes by on an annual basis. We have a postdoctoral fellowship. We uh, obviously uh, uh, put on various fora uh, by uh, means of, uh, well, you know, before the current uh, 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 health crisis, uh, as was true with everyone else, we had um, in-person meetings, uh, which were international in scope. At this moment, we are confined to the vir virtual space, uh, but we've been utilizing uh, two mechanisms by which to approach uh, these matters, something that we call aligning African worlds and uh, diasporic Africa in dialogue. So that's part of what we do in addition to hosting book talks and brown bags for NYU faculty. And we also <clears throat> work with um, New York City uh, middle and high school teachers. And we are in the process as well of working with uh, additional uh, school systems around the country for the purpose of promoting the study of Africa and the African diaspora. <clears throat> we are also uh, uh, in consortia with uh, similar centers around the world as well as in the country. So we are making very nice progress and we, we want to welcome you to, to our deliberations. This uh, session is being recorded and it uh, was it is being coordinated by our administrator, by the Seaside administrator, Ms. Sharice Taylor. We want to thank her for all of her uh, help in, in putting this together. So at this point, I want to introduce the moderator for the session, Dr. Ola Jomoki Ayendele, uh, affectionately known as uh, Dr. Jumo who is a postdoctoral research fellow at our center, the Center for the Study of Africa and the African Diaspora. And she is a non-resident fellow at the Center of Global Affairs here at NYU as well. In her most recent uh, position as senior researcher at the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, Dr. Ayendele supported the production in real of real-time data on political violence in Nigeria. She's Passionate about, passionate about understanding the dynamic relationship and intersection between African governance, human development, and political stability. And she has won numerous awards and grants to conduct her research uh, with visiting research fellowships at the National Defense College, College Abuja and the Center for International Studies at the Institute of Political Science at, uh, at Paris, uh, Sciences Po. A brilliant African security scholar, Dr. Ayendele continues to collaborate with international and regional decision makers, as well as government instruct, uh, institutions in promoting human security initiatives and programs that can create a peaceful and secure Africa. She holds the PhD in global affairs from Rutgers University. Uh, is, is she also has an MPA in international development policy and management and a BA in economics from her alma mater, New York University. So uh, without further ado, I want to uh, turn the session over to Dr. Ayendele. Thank you very much, Dr. Gomez, for the introduction. Thank you, Ms. Taylor, for organizing the logistics of this event. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from your part of the world. Thank you again for joining us to discuss the growing complexities of the Sahelian security space. Today's session promises to be very engaging, and we have four esteemed panelists. Dr. Leonardo is the coordinator of the Sahel Research Group and the Dean of the International Center, as well as Professor of Political Science and African Studies at the University of Florida. Dr. Villalon is a specialist in politics in the Francophone countries of the African Sahel, where he has lived, traveled, and lectured extensively. His research has explored religious involvement in the debates on democracy in Senegal, Mali, and Niger. 
He is also interested in social change and electoral dynamics across the Sahelian region. And then we have Ms. Ornella Moderon, who is the head of the Sahel program at the Institute for Security Studies based in Bamako, Mali. She has 10 years of experience in development, governance, and humanitarian sectors, and has managed um, various um, NGOs. Prior to joining the ISS, Ms. Ornella was head of program with the Danish Refugee Council in Mali and the Danish Demining Group in the Sahel. Her fields of experience include security sector governance, elections and political processes, civil society participation, and gender and security. And then we have Dr. Tatiana, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Centre Francope at the University of Montreal, and an associate researcher at the Sahel Research Group at the University of Florida. Her work focuses on the different forms of violence in the Sahel and centers on insurgency logistics and the responses provided by international organizations and foreign forces in Niger and Mali. And last but not the least is Dr. Daniel Ezinga, who is a research fellow at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies at um, Washington, DC. He is responsible for conducting policy relevant research that advances the understanding of pressing security challenges facing the African continent. Dr. Ezinga's research primarily um, focuses on countering violent extremism in the Sahel and the intersecting roles of civil military relations, traditional uh, institutions and civil society across various regime trajectories. Thank you again for joining us. This is going to be a very engaging session, as I said, that brings together multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary perspectives on what is going on in the Sahel. The Sahel is undergoing a profound and unprecedented change at the military, political, and social levels. And while we know that conflict in the region has largely been driven by a jihadist insurgency that is centered in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, ongoing democratic backsliding from the compounding effects of successive coups, the, Malitaris, um, the Malian junta's collaboration with Russian forces, and the French drawdown of Operation Bakan continues to further complicate the region's security dynamics. And that brings me to my very first question for Dr. Leonardo. In Mali and Burkina Faso, Popular support for the military has been linked to each country's deteriorating security situation, with many citizens believing that a military government is the only way for these countries to finally experience stability. How is this increasing trend of military takeovers affecting the credibility of other state leaders in the Sahel? Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Jumo as I understand you're affectionately called, so when you have greetings from the University of Florida and your friends here. Um, thank you so much and thank you for, for including me in this, uh, in this important discussion. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure, despite the difficulties of the topic, uh, to take part and to, to try to share this. Um, I'll, I'll try to make some general answers, but I have to say, I think some of my colleagues here on the ground, uh, uh, Ms. Ornella or Dan Isenga, who's follows Burkina or Tanya, may be able to address really some of the very um, most immediate and uh, dynamics uh, taking place. But um, indeed, clearly, uh, that what we've seen over the last few years is an increased frustration across the region with the obvious incapacity of either local governments or the international system, the international intervention to ameliorate or to improve the, the security situation, right? Um, we're now uh, almost exactly um, a decade into the crisis in March of 2012 uh, with the coup in Mali that really sparked eventually the French intervention and other outside intervention and this downward spiral. And I think we've seen a continued de uh, degradation of the situation as we have seen it um, and a constant incapacity. And so uh, in this phase now, I'm, I can sort of present this perhaps long durée perspective, a little bit more of a historical. In, this, uh, in the, the current uh, situation, we've seen that there's an increased frustration with the incapacity of the international actors. There's obviously been a significant rise in anti-French sentiment in the region uh, after, you know, it's hard to remember it now, but uh, 
10 years ago, there were people waving French flags in Bamako and in Mali, welcoming the arrival of the French forces. And obviously that's gone. Um, and an increased frustration with the incapacity of various governments in the region. And that's clearly been part of what has led to um, the, the, the military take takeovers and the various coups in Mali and Burkina, it seems to me. Um, so uh, we are, uh, that, that, that dynamic in itself, and I think that was sort of the question, it seems to me is putting extreme pressure in other countries in the region, uh, in Niger in particular, which is at the heart of the crisis, Mali, Bur Burkina and Niger. Um, a, they have to look with a great deal of uh, nervousness at uh, events in Mali and Burkina, and uh, and there's in, you know extraordinary pressure on the Nigerian government to prove its capacity to improve the security situation, uh, especially now as French um, forces shift their focus and their operations to Niger from uh, from Mali. Um, that this is they have to prove that this is a workable partnership. So I think that was your the, sort of the question, and I think that's absolutely the case. Chad is, of course, in the middle of its own transition. It's a much more complicated and difficult situation. And, um, uh, but um, yeah, Dan Eisen could probably address a little bit on Chad there. So that's some very general comments, but I'd be keen to hear how some of my colleagues here respond to that question. Yes, yeah, so over to you, Dan. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> No, no, no problem at all. And um, uh, I want to say thanks to everyone. And uh, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, such an illustrious panel and uh, great, great folks to listen to. So I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, uh, I'd be happy to talk about Chad for, for a quick second. But before I do, I, I think something that's really important to follow up from what Leo was saying is that um, uh, yes, everyone's really frustrated with the situation because it's it's awful and it's only gotten worse. And uh, you can go back and you can look at the um, the the number of violent events or the uh, the fatalities associated with those events, and it's quite stark um, the empirical evidence for how terrible this crisis has grown um, and and spread uh, for that matter, um, uh, emanating out of northern Mali initially and and now really. Uh, I think that in 2021, for the first time, uh, the majority of activity from militant Islamist groups or, or uh, other forms of political violence uh, was really centered in Burkina Faso for the first time. Um, and so we've seen this crisis evolve, uh, the security situation evolve in, in uh, complex ways that have been awful uh, for the everyday life of citizens on the ground. Um, and so that frustration is is understandable. I think that unfortunately, uh, from from my perspective and, and what I've seen so far, that uh, we, we shouldn't anticipate that military coups are going to yield a, a better outcome. Um, in fact, I've, I've been doing some work recently focused on Mali, and um, and you know you kind of look at the standard claims that the the junta there has been making. Uh, and the, a big one is that the security situation is improving, um, but very little uh, actual evidence of improvement is, is there. Um, you, can, you could look at um, some, some specific examples, some of which have been in the news lately, um, uh, thinking specifically of the events in Mura, where the, the Malian soldiers alongside Russian mercenaries stand accused of, of killing perhaps over 300 civilians. Um, that's a terrible atrocity. Uh, it, may, it may be the largest atrocity that Mali has experienced in, I, I think, the entire crisis. Uh, and so you have the, these individual events, but you might also look at the track record of the junta during its time in power. Um, and I've, that's something I've been working on, and, and I'm finding that um, if you, I'm, I'm, I'm initial phases of this data uh, review, but looking at uh, the number of violent events uh, waged by militant Islamist groups in the region, so the, the insecurity that the junta purportedly is there to prevent, if you look at it every quarter since the junta has come in power, it's never been lower than any quarter when the IBK administration was in power. Uh, and so it goes up and goes down while the junta is in power, but it's never lower than it was before they arrived. Uh, and, and so I think that that's indicative of the fact that they're really not improving the security situation as they claim. Um, and uh, I think unfortunately in Chad, the story is a bit different, but also the same. Uh, you know, in Chad, what happened in, in uh, April, 2021, if I'm not mixing up my years, 
um, the former president, Idris Devi, uh, died in battle uh, as a, a rebel contingent came from southern Libya to try and oust him, uh, and he met them in the field. Um, or at least that's the story that we, we, we know to be the official version, and when no one really knows the details, we may never know. Um, but his son was then uh, put in power to secede him by a military junta um, as they kind of coalesced quickly around him to fill the power vacuum uh, that Idris Debi's death created. Uh, and I think that it's different from Mali and Burkina in that they're not facing such a, um, a, a calamity, such a catastrophic level of, of, of uh, security crisis in Chad. Uh, it, it hasn't, the situation in Chad hasn't degraded as quickly uh, or as dramatically for citizens on the ground, um, but they do face security crises uh, in part because they've had effectively a military government or a very strong authoritarian government for decades. Uh, and the rise of Idris Dhabi's son to secede him in power it, during this transition uh, is just another example of trying to continue with this strongman logic for stability. Um, but I think that there's a lot of research that suggests that democratic transitions, while messy, uh, with lots of false starts and, and fits and starts, um, are actually better in the long term for stability and security. Uh, I think that there's quite a bit of evidence of that. And, uh, and so unfortunately, I see these forms of transitions and the, the interventions of the military into politics as as, as steps backwards in many ways and counterproductive for trying to establish uh, stability in the region. Um, I think I'll leave my comments there for now. Thank you, Dan, very detailed. And then I would move to Ms. Ornella because you're on ground um, and you recently wrote um, a policy paper about the ECOWAS sanction on Mali, uh, Mali's military junta um, and how there has been non-adherence to said sanction. So I wonder in your own opinion, how this um, looks on ECOWAS and its legitimacy in the region. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jumu. This is a great question. And first of all, let me say also that I'm very happy to be part of this conversation. And, uh, and I've already been picking up, picking up on some uh, very interesting ideas I hope we can get back to. So, um, you know, the... Um, the, the series of coups that the region has been experiencing. So I, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm based in Mali and I've been based here for the past four years now working on uh, security and governance related issues. Um, the series of coups we have seen recently, I think, are not only connected to the public dissatisfaction over um, a, an ever worsening secu secu security crisis, sorry. Of course, this is an element, but I think it's important to keep in mind that Behind that, and if we go back to uh, what started uh, the August 2020 coup in, in Mali, for instance, is essentially political issues, not, not security issues. So if we remember uh, in August 2020, uh, what happened was a military takeover in the context of, um, excuse me, I have to cut this, so I am not annoyed all the time. Okay, this is done. <laughs> um, uh, in, in the context of, um, of a post-electoral crisis. So we had, um, we had parliamentary polls in March and April, 2020, uh, which were highly contested for fairly good reasons, frankly, um, and followed by a political and social crisis, which uh, the sitting government, had, had, at the time responded to in a very poor way. Um, so this is the context in which um, so a social movement, the M5 RFP back then, um, groomed and built up and eventually led to uh, essentially a group of military officers separate from, from them taking power and building a whole narrative around how this transition uh, would be an opportunity to, uh, to reset the, ba the basic social contract on which the, the country relies. I think it's important to have these elements in mind because um, we could be tempted otherwise to assume that because the, the various transitions are led by military, the key point is military. Actually, the main argument they have been uh, building on for most of the time 
uh, has been on political reforms, has been on the need to essentially restructure the way the state functions in order to make it more effective, which is something that speaks to people. So I think that's one of the elements why they managed to leverage such level of popularity. The second element, and here I think is coming back to um, your notion that, you know, uh, having military junta somehow raises expectations that the military response will be better, is in fact best, um, best um, illustrated in the case of Burkina Faso, I think. Um, what we saw in Burkina Faso is a coup in January this year that emanated from a long-standing um, misunderstanding and a series of disagreements really between the political elite, which in this case would include the, the higher level political uh, establish military establishment as well, uh, and the kind of more foot on the ground uh, security personnel. So in this case, yes, definitely the notion that having military leaders would mean that they have better means to, uh, to conduct the kind of strategy that's needed is something that resonates with people. Now, of course, there are a number of problems with these uh, rationales and we could come back to it. But um, let me quickly get to the actual question you, you asked me after this long digression, <laughs> which I found necessary, which was about ECOWAS and and the, the, I mean, what this tells us about uh, the crisis of legitimacy that ECOWAS, I believe, is indeed facing. You know, ECOWAS as a regional organization was, was initially built uh, for economic integration reasons and then evolved into a much more political role, uh, upholding uh, values of, you know, um, uh, rule of law, democratic norms, and things like that, which is important, but, with, but which in the implementation uh, is increasingly coming across as a, a matter of double standards. So on the one hand, you have the, the ECOWAS, which, um, which indulges uh, Guinea's and Ivory Coast um, uh, constitutional tweakings in order to promote their terms. You have the ECOWAS that turns a blind eye on the authoritarian um, uh, abuses of, of, of the Benin, Republic uh, government, you have an, uh, the, the ECOWAS that has no problem with, uh, with Togo having no term limitation what, whatsoever. And then on the other hand, you have this very same ECOWAS um, uh, insisting that military coups are absolutely unacceptable. On top of that, I think, is the way in which these um, this political crisis that coups really are, uh, are being handled by the AQS as well. Um, in Mali, there is a mediation that's being led by former uh, Nigerian pre president, Goodluck Jonathan, which many have forgotten is not a mediation that was set up after the coup in 2020, but before. So this is a mediation that was actually um, set up um, a few, well, a couple of months uh, in late June, if my memory is good, of 2020, in order to mediate the post-electoral crisis that was happening back then. So in fact, the very um, uh, occurrence of the coup in August was essentially the failure of that mediation. Nonetheless, the very same mediation setup has been maintained uh, and, and continues to, to this day, which also raises a number of questions about just the level of, of effectiveness of the tools that the ECOWAS um, is able or willing to, to mobilize. On top of that, and, and this would be the last element um, supporting this legitimacy crisis, I think, um, well, the last I, I will mention, there's potentially a lot more, um, is uh, the notion that, you know, um, among parts of, um, of, of Sahel constituency, there is this growing notion that ECOWAS would be, or some of the ECOWAS heads of state at least, would be uh, subjected to um, foreign extra-regional, extra-continental influence, which of course damages a lot um, their perception of neutrality and independence and in fact uh, consistency of the decisions they are taking. So in this context, the fact that these um, these sanctions were taken in, in, in January uh, against Mali, essentially created the very opposite of the, the, the purpose they were meant to. So essentially these sanctions were meant to dislocate the, the social ground under the feet of the uh, Malian junta, which 
did not happen. Instead, what we saw is a consolidation of public opinion around them, including people who are not necessarily supporting them in the first place. But it became a matter of us against them. It became a matter of national sovereignty toward against um, uh, external um, 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 uh, endurance. So, of course, this has had um, um, quite quite negative consequences on the credibility uh, of ECOWAS as an ECOWAS of the states rather than an ECOWAS of the people, and as an institution that that comes with a um, uh, with a whip, with a um, um, uh, beating stick, instead of coming with more constructive approach to look for solutions that would actually take into account, um, in part, some of the legitimate needs and claims of the people, such as we need political reforms. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Onella. And um, this moves me to um, Dr. Tatiana because of your work. Um, on you know, international organizations and the responses that are provided to international organizations and foreign forces in Niger and Mali. We can't talk about hell without talking about the increasing role of Russia, as we know today. Uh, so I do want to ask, in your own opinion, and this is very complex, we know that this is not something that you can answer in you know, five to eight minutes, but I would like your opinion on how Russian mercenaries that have been invited to Mali as French and EU forces withdraw, how this increased presence in the Sahel would affect counterterrorism efforts and strategies. Okay, uh, yes, thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation to participate in this, in this talk. Um, Okay, so the, actually, it's it's really very complicated question, and I think I will proceed in a, in a, in a, in in several steps to answer it. Like first, I would like to 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 describe very briefly Russia Africa relations um, that uh, can be. Um, described like through three periods of that. So like the first stage, uh, it. It, it can be characterized like from the late of the 80s to the early 90s. It corresponds to Russia's withdrawal, withdrawal from Africa as Russia was moving closer to the West. The second stage starts in the early 2000s. So it corresponds to, to the arrival of Putin to power and to the confrontation, to the beginning of the confrontation with the West. So the third stage, I will put it in 2014. So it is related to the war in Ukraine. So um, the third stage, uh, which which we are in, which we are today, so it's it's I think it's it started in twenty third in twenty fourteen and um, it um, uh, it received an additional boost uh, in f starting from February twenty nineteen of the cartoon agreement between the Central African government of. President Faustin uh, Toadera and 14 Central African armed groups. So it is a very important stage in, um, in Russia-Africa relations in terms of uh, Russia as being presented itself as a peace builder and exporter of peace uh, internationally. Um, and um, um, and from, I think that Basically, from from it, it 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 started happening before 2019, but 2019 the Khartoum agreements it, it was a pivotal moment from that time, and uh, when counterterrorism strategy Russia counterterrorism strategy has uh, increasingly turned into the legitimator of the collaboration between Russia and Africa, so globally. Through 2017, 2021, um, Russia signed military agreements with all G5 countries, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso, Chad, and Mauritania. So these agreements concern mainly the training of military experts, military personnel, and exchange of information of political military issues. So Mali signed a military cooperation in June 2019. Uh, at least we don't have a specific data date for that, but at least in September 2021, Russian mercenaries started to appear uh, in Mali. So um, um, 
we all know that Russian mercenaries, they are also deployed in Sudan, Libya, the Central African Republic and Mozambique with different uh, consequences on the ground. So what happened actually, uh, what happened, uh, um, it's, it's very complicated actually, your question is very complicated. Um, in order to analyze why Mali decided to, to ask for um, military intervention from Wagner is a, an extremely complicated question, but I wouldn't go into the details, but I would say a thing in my opinion is that, well, maybe not very original one, but the war on terrorism has always been a battle of ideas and Russia and the West offer different counter narratives in this regard. So basically there is a fundamental contradiction between um, the Russian emphasis on stability at the cost of democracy and the Western emphasis on democracy at the cost of stability. It's basically what happened in, in Mali or in Central African Republic. So um, along this line of thinking, Russian maintained that uh, it's counter in, in its uh, counterinsurgency, counterterrorist strategy is more effective and trustworthy than Africa's traditional Western partners. Um, and it was part of the rhetoric, part of the propaganda that is currently fueling Mali's social media or Burkina Faso or Niger, basically Sahelian social media on Twitter, Facebook accounts, and so on. But I think we should also. Uh, see very deeply what uh, is hidden behind this uh, implication of Russia uh, and specifically the, um, the success uh, of Russia's uh, being able to sell its product as peace, like, like in the Russian way of, of seeing that, to, uh, to Malian leaders and to Central African leaders and well, maybe Libya and Mozambique, it's, it's a bit different cases. Um, I think it's a very important question that we all have to think about why it happened. I will not go into the details about that, but I will, in order to answer your question about the future of, um, of Russian mercenaries, of uh, about on future of Russian increased presence in the Sahel. I think that um, one can say that a lot depends on the outcome of the war in Ukraine, um, but I wouldn't really, really say that um, the outcome of the war in Ukraine would change very deeply Russia's engagement in Africa. Uh, for many reasons, because Russia's engagement in Africa has become very, very deep um, uh, on different levels in different countries. It, it is economic and security, basically. And um, in some countries, like in Central African Republic, I think that um, Global West is not really interested in disengagement of uh, Russian military from the country, uh, partly because um, one would speculate on what, would, what might happen if Russia would disengage. It might lead to further escalation of the conflict. However, the tragic, uh, absolutely tragedy that happened in Mura uh, in the end of March, or when 300 civilians were executed in, by Malian military uh, and uh, possibly uh, Russian mercenaries, there was an investigation uh, made by Human Rights Watch. It's, it's, it's a huge red flag uh, on what might happen in the nearest future in the Sahel, provided uh, Russian mercenaries would stay in Mali, because the situation in Mali is not absolutely not the same as what is happening in Central African Republic. And the protection of civilians is one of the huge issues uh, that might lead to stabilization in, in, in Sahel. And I think that if Russian mercenaries would stay 
in the Sahel, or at least it would stay in the, mod in the modalities as they are currently in Mali, that would undermine um, the, 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 the safety of civilians and that would lead to further destabilization. I cannot even imagine on what kind of scale. So I think that I, I'm done with my observations on the question. It's Thank you so much, Dr. Tatiana. Does anybody want to jump in? I know it's a very complex um, question with a lot of uh, moving parts, but you know, hearing from a historical and multidisciplinary perspective um, might help in also improving our understanding on um, what's going on on the ground with um, um, Russia's increasing presence. Okay, I see a hand from Anella. <laughs> Yes, so um, perhaps just on, on the back of uh, Tatiana's comments um, about this issue of the Russian presence and so on, I think um, an important element to have uh, in mind is, first of all, as we speak in the Sahel, um, the only country for, we, for which we have kind of solid elements uh, is really Mali. Uh, there, has, there has been talks about um, potentially, you know, uh, Russian elements trying to, to get into Burkina Faso, but this hasn't been substantiated that I know of, but maybe I can be corrected. So I will just mainly be focusing on, on the Malian case here. Um, from a Malian perspective, um, collaboration with Russia as a state is uh, a long-standing partnership that has been working pretty well. Let's not forget that um, uh, by the time Mali was uh, get, getting its independence in the 1960s, um, the, the, the newly built country decided to, uh, to ask the former colonial power to withdraw its troops, which is the Army Day, 20th of January, celebrated to this day every single year. Um, uh, and uh, instead developed partnerships with uh, then USSR and now Russia uh, over a very long period of time. So the collaboration with Russia is not something that's new here. What is new, I think, is um, the kind of strategic shift we have observed over the last few months from what used to be for the first 10 years of this crisis, um, a mainly uh, Western driven or Western oriented set of partnerships towards something that's much more uh, at this point, um, um, a complete overhaul of this uh, partnership framework towards the East, towards Russia and including um, private actors. So this is something that's definitely changing the uh, dynamics, but but in no way it can be, I think, completely um, um, uh, separated from the notion that, well, Russia and Mali have had a long-standing uh, partnership. The second element is that, you know, um, um, in the West, uh, generally speaking, and, and it's funny that in 2022, we would uh, go back to using terminology like in the West and the East, um, funny or worrisome, <laughs> that's one thing. Uh, but I mean, in the um, in Europe and, um, and North America, uh, generally speaking, um, there is this very clear uh, understanding of the extent to which uh, Russia's internal and international uh, policy is not oriented on democracy, is not uh, respectful of uh, liberties and freedoms and so on. These are not elements that are followed very closely by public opinions in the, uh, in the Sahel. So what comes across more is the kind of um, uh, simplified figure of the so-called strong man, the, the uh, military leader or former KGB leader, um, officer who gets things done, who da 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 and who also speaks truth to what is perceived from here still as um, a collection of uh, foreign, um, foreign, um, uh, well, of at least allies of the foreign colonial power, which is, you know, uh, called out for issues of arrogance, for issues of imperialism, and so on. So these, I think, are part of the elements which explain why this uptake um, within the public opinion has been so easy. Of course, this is pro problematic for a number of reasons, and, and I think my uh, 
pre pre predecessors or laid them out very, very clearly in terms of, you know, the human rights impact, the long-term impact on all of this. Um, but yeah, it's important, I think, to, to resituate the, these elements. And perhaps just one last point is um, another reason why this is um, getting a quite positive public uh, welcoming uh, in Mali, at least a, to quite some extent, um, is also the fact that you know we're 10 years into this crisis that's only get, been getting worse and worse and worse. And this shows to, to some extent that everything that's been tried before has not worked, has not been working. So there is a sense of desperation that makes it uh, much more acceptable to just try something new, anything new. Um, and that makes the, the price that comes with it seem a lot more relative. So I have heard around you know, comments like, well, yes, there might be um, uh, economic costs associated to this, but there was with the previous partners. Uh, there might be human rights costs associated to, to this, but there were, was with the, the previous partners as well. All these elements may be true, but they're clearly not at the same scale and uh, on the same level, which is completely getting uh, erased from the, the public space as an element of, uh, of um, consideration and, and dialogue. So yeah, these are some of, of the things I perhaps just wanted to add. Thank you so much, um, Ornella. And um, Dr. Gomez has raised a hand. So I would give um, the floor uh, to him. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayundele. And thank the, I wanna thank the panelists um, <clears throat> for what has been a really wonderful, um, uh, a, a set of presentations thus far, uh, very diplomatically presented, very careful uh, in the analysis, and I, I really want to push a little, a little, push a little on that. See if I can get you to um, uh, extend your comments a bit. I am, uh, you know, I remember, uh, you know, I, I conducted some research in Mali prior to 2012. And I remember the, um, it was a kind of cascading experience with the fall of Gaddafi in, in Libya and the movement of, of men and material into the Sahel. And I, I, I remember watching uh, Sadiel or ECOWAS uh, in their serial response to the growing crisis uh, in Mali. And uh, the lesson that came across to me was the, um, the frailty and inability of ECOWAS to respond. Uh, that may be um, impertinent or unfair uh, but when the French came in in 2012, um, you know, I think there was general relief in the region. Um, since then, things have deteriorated, continue to, to deteriorate, as has been remarked upon. So I'm interested in what goes, so what, what lies ahead? I'm not encouraged by what's happening in the Central African Republic. It raises questions in terms of what does this what does this mean for Mali in terms of the relationship with Russia uh, or the Wag Wagner group or whatever it is uh, there? What does this mean? Uh, and I would, I would, I, I wonder if the panelists would be willing to engage in a little pro prognostication and speculate, if you will, as to what they see coming down the pipe with respect to Mali in particular, and obviously Niger, Burkina Faso, with with respect to the Russian, uh, with respect to the Russian uh, presence there. No, we have a, a very interesting example of what happens in Syria, and I'm just I'm interested to know what the what the panelists think about this. Uh, Will the junta in Mali continue to operate relatively autonomously uh, or not? Will the influence grow? And what does that portend? Uh, Dr. Smirnova, 
I would really be interested to hear you speak a little more because uh, in, in it, because um, a number of your observances, observations rather ended with this is very complicated and you moved on. And it, maybe you'd be willing to engage a little bit in some of those complexities and just kind of unwrap some of that for us. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Gomez. It's really, <laughs> yes, it's, it's very interesting comments that, that you're, you're making. Um, and it's really complicated to make some speculations on that, but I will try. I'm very extremely pessimistic. I'm very, very pessimistic about this, the current situation in the Sahel. Um, first, um, I think that uh, the withdrawal uh, of, of withdrawal of Fran France and European military forces from the Sahel would lead to further destabilization in the Sahel. And I think that uh, the fact that uh, um, the current rearticulation of the whole military dispositive um, as, it's, as it is happening now, basically to Ivory Coast, partly to Niger, something is not very well decided until now, um, will not respond basically to, to the problem that is happening in the Sahel, the, the, to the insurgency, uh, what is happening, to the dynamics of insurgency. And I think that, uh, I think that, uh, um, Russia's influence would, uh, well, everything depends on the outcome of the Ukraine, well, mu much depends on the outcome of the Ukrainian war. But from what I feel, from what I hear from Mali on the ground, is that I was really uh, very surprised because people, they continue to support Russia regardless what's happening in Ukraine, regardless of these bombings, these absolutely tragedy what's happening and I when I ask people what's happening why you why you you you, you still support Russia uh, because uh, there is no um, what's happening in Mali and it, it's uh, kind of a um, there is what's to, to a certain extent it's what's happening in Russia as well it's kind of a uh, block of alternative uh, sources of information. So people, they, they, uh, Russian propaganda is, is working very, very well in Russia and it's working very, very well in Mali and in, in I don't know how it's working in Burkina Faso, but I know it's working very well in Mali. Uh, um, and I think that as, as uh, Ornella pointed it out already, there is an extreme fatigue of foreign interventions in, in the Sahel and it impacts uh, uh, deeply uh, populations and um, it, it, it makes an incentive for Russian engagement in, in the Sahel. So I think that, uh, we, we do not know really what, what will happen in Ukraine, but uh, we might imagine that similar scenario that is it happened in Mali, it might happen in Burkina Faso, and it might also happen in Niger in the years to come. I will not be very surprised if it will happen. Uh, so we do not know what will happen in Ukraine, if Putin will stay in power or not, but um, even uh, if he will not stay in power, uh, possibly uh, Russia will stay in the Sahel, but maybe form of engagement will change. Um, and, um, uh, and I'm extremely pessimistic because as I mentioned, uh, for me, mm, protection of civilians is a critical issue for stabilization uh, mm, process in the Sahel. So, uh, uh, so Russian presence as it is, uh, Russian, the, the form in way in which Russia is present now in the Sahel, like we mean mercenaries, and the ways they, and how they implement counter-terrorist operations that they managed to sell it to Mali uh, will, uh, 
uh, continue to to it will it will have a, a destabilization effect in in Mali and so on. So I don't. It's very difficult for me to to speak on very in details on this issue, but. Mm, because we are in a prospective scenario, but maybe maybe other panelists have have different ideas on that. I don't know. Dr. Leonardo. Um, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'll try to contribute something there. I think, Dr. Gomez, I think you're pushing us a little bit to sort of you know prognose where 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 is this going? And if I could, I'll just make a. A, a couple of general comments and see if other people can jump in. You you talked about, um, uh, I think we do have to take a little bit of a historical perspective here in the sense you talked about Mali before 2012. Sort of, you know, I, I think it's important to remind ourselves the current situation in the Sahel was unthinkable 15 years ago or 20 years ago, completely unthinkable. Um, those of us working in this area thought that this was, if somebody had prognosticated the collapse of governments as kind of wide scale violence at the local level in areas that were um, you know, extremely um, um, poor, places with lots of economic and uh, challenges and lots of resource scarcity. And nevertheless, there was an awful lot of cooperation with fairly, with very functional societies, et cetera. And so I don't think anybody really knows how this has happened, but it's very clear that, um, a, that there were a series of political failures to me, I believe, a series of political failures that Mali's at the epicenter, that collapse. And uh, we have spent an enormous amount of time since then talking about what are the causes and how do we go back? Um, and I think what I, the, the comment that I'd like to make is that I think and we're well past that. There is no going back. There is no, the sort of notion that it's gonna be a military solution. We're gonna come back to what the Sahel was in 2000 or 2005, for that matter, 2010, um, right? Be, before the collapse of Mali is unthinkable. The, the landscape has been transformed completely. And, uh, and these groups that we thought of as fringe small groups, spin-offs of the Algerian problems of the Group Islamic Garme or Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb in the Sahara that we thought were small groups have been transformed into a presence on the ground where there's completely transformed religious uh, dynamics, completely transformed uh, ethnic dynamics. And the only solutions are gonna be political ones um, uh, that that attempt to uh, to recognize those realities and find compromises and ways to live, um, and and ways at at the local level and hopefully at, at state levels. It's hard to be optimistic about that happening anytime in the short term. I think if we look around and think of things like Somalia, it's pretty clear that the international system and the African state system and whatever is capable of tolerating pretty difficult situations for decades. Um, um, and, and they can just fester and stay bad for a very, very long time. And uh, so it's, it's hard to be so pessimistic because it's painful, but it's also, I think, if we start from that point of departure, that there's no, it's not like, you know, Humpty Dumpty fell off, we're gonna put it all back together again and the puzzle broke it. This is a new point of departure. We have to accept that those groups are there, that these presences are there, and how are we gonna find workable arrangements so that people can start to, lead reasonably secure lives and build uh, somehow. I, I don't have any answers and I, that, that's perhaps just a very broad pessimistic statement, but I think it's, it's important to recognize that reality. It, it strikes me. Um, yeah, yeah, and let me take you back off your comments, Dr. Leonardo, and this is to Dan. You know, we've talked about the, the Sahelian context and the um, evolving um, political violence and how we have seen it manifest. And I wonder in your opinion, because now we're, we're looking at ways forward, what evolving threats, because these threats are evolving, must state security forces and state leaders address in their efforts to actually decrease the ability of a lot of these transnational groups, whether they be violent extremist groups or criminal groups to recruit and mobilize um, foot soldiers um, in the Sahel. Wow, thanks. Uh, that's a that's a huge uh, question. <laughs> One could approach it from many different ways, and I'm uh, still swimming in my mind about Russia and, and Wagner mercenaries, um, uh, which I think is probably a a, a, a very negative contributor <laughs> in terms of of uh, radicalization and recruitment. I think that um, there's a huge body of evidence that uh, when you don't protect civilians. Um, and that, uh, or, or when, you know, human rights abuses become more integrated into security services, 
um, that, uh, that that contributes to recruitment, that that uh, is a so-called push factor uh, for, for radicalization. Um, and so perhaps as just a jumping off point, I'll say that uh, I don't see um, you know, the, the uh, use of, of Wagner uh, mercenaries um, in the field as being uh, at all a deterrent uh, in terms of radicalization. Um, and I think that it comes with other um, uh, potential counterproductive costs. Um, you know, there's a lot of criticism that's been lobbed at the international intervention in Mali, um, rightfully so. They, they were unable to solve this crisis, right? I, mean, uh, uh, I don't think it's really, um, uh, you know, that, that criticism or the fatigue uh, of this crisis uh, is something wholly different in my mind uh, from uh, joining forces with Wagner mercenaries, which have a documented world record of uh, using human, human rights abuses and other forms of atrocities to intimidate uh, and, and coerce uh, populations uh, in, into a situation. And, um, and, and just so I can continue with my two cents on Russia, I'll say that I think uh, to the extent that it's useful or helpful to look at other areas like Central African Republic, like Syria, like Libya, um, with all of their differences, uh, there is a sort of key strategic element uh, from the Wagner Russia angle, which is that they're there for regime security. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, if we're to prog prognosticate a little into the future, that one of the things to be very worried about and compelled by in terms of the evidence from other cases is that uh, Wagner forces may be there, in fact, to help the junta stay in power. Uh, and I think that the junta has made a lot of decisions out in the open about wanting to stay in power. Um, the defiance they've showed towards ECOWAS, um, or they could, they could take action to have sanctions removed today. Um, they have to negotiate and step back from where their positions are, but they don't, uh, and, uh, and, and they haven't. Um, so I think that that suggests that there is a degree of wanting to hang on to power and, and perhaps that is, uh, perhaps we should give them the benefit of the doubt and that they are there uh, to implement a complete new social contract, a, a, uh, a, a you know, 100% overhaul of, of political reform and systems. Um, you know, I, I've, I've listened uh, to other panelists and um, feeling that uh, you know, that that's what's needed is something new, a, a complete reform of the, of, of the politi political social system. Um, but I do not know of any examples where military juntas have successfully uh, accomplished such a feat. Um, I think that in fact, uh, that those things are um, more commonly accomplished over time and iteration uh, in a democratic setting, meaning, meaning not, not necessarily uh, the, the French version of liberal democracy, uh, but a democratic setting in which uh, citizens are able to voice their interests uh, and are able to accommodate amongst each other uh, to find some form of, of uh, consensual uh, governance. And I think that, that that process is one that also helps in the countering violent extremism world to bring it back uh, to the to question, Jumo, that you've posed me. Um, I think that um, the more that you can an, include uh, communities at all levels, uh, all the way up to national and regional levels, uh, in a, a consensual process about what governance look at, looks like, what their interests are, how to achieve those interests, uh, and, and do so in a moderated setting, uh, I think you're, you're likely to take the fuel out of radicalization processes. Um, and, and so I think that you know, this is, this is a, a bit of a, a trope now that governance is more important uh, if we're to have security. Uh, we hear this all the time, the, the, the development uh, security nexus. Uh, there are lots of, of taglines. They're all really struggling with this idea. Uh, the idea is that uh, local, local folks, uh, local communities, uh, the, the, the uh, individual, often young men who are pulled into uh, a circle of radicalization and recruitment to then go fight. Um, they're 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 needing uh, some form of of governance system, uh, uh, and 
uh, there's been a failure to provide those forms of services and those, uh, those fora uh, for them to interact with in, in a sense that they would have voice for their own interests and needs. Um, I, I, th I think that that's ultimately the, the big picture goal. Um, and in the meantime, there are important steps that can be taken to de-radicalize and help reintegrate people into a process that allows for that. I don't think we're very close to that in the Sahel. Um, I think, unfortunately, we continue to be uh, in, a, in a negative spin of the cycle. Um, but I think that the next steps in the immediate future uh, really need to start taking some lessons learned from places uh, that have had some success with de-radicalization. Um, and if that can if that can be accomplished, then um, I think that that then lends itself to starting a process of of better countering violent extremists, better better countering countering recruitment and uh, and other forms of radicalization. So I'm, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. So we're going to go to Tatiana, um, Ms. Ronella, and then Dr. Gomez. Yes, I would like just to make a short comment on what Dan has just said about about like for the for the possibility of uh, of, of the use of Russian mercenaries by different other leaders as a way to stay in power. And I think it's really important to say that on the impact of isolation of regimes, of like regimes that would come to power by military coups, of the impact of isolation on further destabilization, as we've seen in Mali. I think it was a, a very huge mistake of international community to go into this uh, spiral or spin of isolation that also contributed to the escalation that we are having in currently in Mura, for example. The, the, the tragedy that happened in Mura, it's just like 50 kilometers of, from Sevare, from the Minusma, where Minusma is bad, and when Minusma doesn't intervene, we all know for different reasons and so on. But I think that it's very, very important if you want to think over possible solutions not to isolate like regimes uh, that would use possibly Russian mercenaries as a way to, to stay in power. I think it's really very important to, to, to keep that in mind that isolation would not lead to stabilization, it would contribute to escalation of the conflict. So uh, it's just what I wanted to, to add. Thank you, Tatiana. Over to you, Onella. <laughs> Thank you. So um, since Dr. Gomez invited us to be less uh, politically correct uh, and perhaps more just um, a bit just more, more blunt, um, I would like to actually challenge one of the basic assumptions we tend to work from, I think, as, as a research community, either uh, academic or policy research, as well as policymakers also a lot, which is the kind of, you know, um, the democratic peace theory, I would say. Um, and I heard a bit of that in the, in the comments that uh, Dr. Daniel made, you know, this notion that it's, it's better achieved with this particular path. Um, one of the things that I hear a lot from here, here in Bamako from, very educated people with a lot of experience, with a lot of knowledge about African history and so on is, well, look at Ghana and what the coup by JJ Rawlings turned into. Um, look at Mali where we were under, um, under uh, Musa Traoré and what uh, the intervention of the ATT did, um, the ATT coup in, in, in 1991 did. Look at other examples. So, I mean, I think there is something we have to acknowledge here, which is that just um, um, value-based principled stances are not enough to convince people. And the fact that uh, elite thinkers, such as uh, researchers, policymakers, et cetera, think of otherwise is not enough to make a difference itself. What is needed, I believe, is, um, is um, concrete results. And this is, these are very concrete issues we're dealing with. We're talking about the safety of people in remote areas, sometimes in not that remote areas, that's one, of course, but we're also dealing about fundamental issues of, you know, um, um, state effectiveness and the ability for people to see value in following a certain model. This is, these are models that have been promoted as a bit of um, 
an empty shell, I would say, for the past 30 years. So as uh, Dr. Leo was mentioning earlier on, just 15 years ago, it was very difficult to envision that, uh, that uh, Mali would be in the current si 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 situation and let, let alone the, the whole of cell. But actually, when you look at what we now know were some of the root factors, well, should it have been that difficult to, to predict? I mean, um, we did see signs such as, you know, um, uh, apparently cohesive societies, which were actually based on extreme social stratifications, on mechanisms of slavery. Um, uh, and these are things that that persist and that and that form part of the underlying uh, social dis dissatisfaction that keeps fueling um, at least communal level violence. We had enough um, uh, knowledge at the time, you know, at the beginning of uh, the 2010 decade about the fact that the northern part of Mali was getting completely sanctuarized on purpose and by pol policy, by design, uh, by the the Atlantic government in order to promote specific type of um, uh, pol political economy um, gains and so on and so forth. Um, we also had um, a quite good understanding of the way in which North Africa and the Sahel are connected. Did we see, um, I mean, did we anticipate what would come uh, with the intervention of, uh, well, of uh, NATO in, in Libya. I mean, I, I do think that we should be a bit more um, willing and, and, and engaging in questioning some of the basic assumptions we, we work from. And one of those, I, I, I believe, is this notion that, well, um, um, nothing good comes out of uh, political transitions led by military actors. Understand me clearly, I'm not saying that this is a good thing, and I don't want to be quoted saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is, at the end of the day, what I think do doesn't matter. What people in my think does, and this is what, um, I mean, this is what's driving the narrative, and, and we can't just uh, pretend that there is no uh, historical elements to, to, to back that as a potentially valid um, um, point. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Vanella. Um, over to you, Dr. Gomez, and then we would open it up to the floor. We had some questions coming in for the panelists that are very, very engaging. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, this has been very rich and very uh, thought-provoking uh, and, and highly generative. I, and I want to connect immediately and segue, um, articulate to what uh, Ornella uh, just uh, addressed. Yeah, you know, my own politics are such that I, let me just, it, this, be, this may be entirely unfair, but I was completely, uh, I was thoroughly disappointed with ECOWAS, uh, say the owl's uh, response to the crisis that culminated in 2012. I mean, it was just, you know, if you go back and you read the, if you just read through the, the you know, uh, the media and the newspapers and so forth and so on as that as that crisis was unfolding. I mean, ECOWAS was meeting every week, and they did nothing. And 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 you know there was you know they didn't have the material, they didn't have the men, they needed the Europe to supply them with the weaponry, so forth and so on. Nothing was done until France intervened. Now. The critique that we're hearing now, where you are now, Ornella, in in Mali itself, is that you know you have this foreign influence, and so now with the current military, the the you know this has been counter uh, countermanded. Uh, Mali has moved into a new era, and so forth. And you know, I hope that's right. I really, really do. I I I, but I have my reservations about it. And it goes back to the handling of Mora. And I've been really following the, the, the government's response to what's, what took place in Mora. And I mean, are we honestly to believe that 300 quote unquote terrorists were killed in that town? I mean, how likely is that? That's the first thing. The second thing is the UN is not being, it, they're not allowing the UN into the town. What is that about? 
So I'm really, so what does that, I'm, I'm really worried about what this portends with respect to the current military junta's relationship to Russia. And, um, you know, it's, it's not trending in a good direction. I'm, I'm done, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gomez, for your comments. And now we are going to open it up to um, the public. I do have one comment from Dr. Yvonne Ilunga. And his question states, most of the security and political analysis in the region seem to be tied to the relationship that countries in the Sahel have with foreign Western countries, as we have discussed. Can we also argue that what we are seeing in the Sahel is a sign of awakening in African consciousness? Then it has a part B, which is, what is the primary strategic interest of countries in the Sahel who can continue to be in pursuit with or without outside involvement? This is open to anybody who wants to take part A or part B or both. Okay, Daniel. I'll, I'll break the ice. Uh, thank you for the, the great questions um, and, uh, and to all the wonderful comments from our panelists. It's been really a pleasure and stimulating for me. I, uh, I'll put on my other hat. I'm a, so I'm a political scientist by training, and, uh, and so uh, I'm eager to engage in debates over governance and the best way to do things. But uh, uh, at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, we focus heavily on security forces and, um, and thinking through um, sort of the, the strategic interests of countries and, and what their security policy might look like. And, and uh, ways to adapt that. And so I've been working for a long time on, a, on an important project, I think, for Sahelian um, countries um, uh, with folks in the Sahel and outside of the Sahel, aimed at, uh, you know, what would your security forces look like if you were going to be effective on the ground uh, in this form of crisis, in this form of security crisis, humanitarian crisis. Um, and uh, and the, the, the key Point. And so, so I think this speaks to what the strategic interests are of Sahelian countries. Um, uh, I think the, the operating from a strategic framework, you, you know, they, uh, Sahelian countries have to be concerned about the security threats that they face. Uh, protecting civilians uh, is, is paramount there. Um, uh, addressing insurgents and insurgencies um, and trying to do so in a way that doesn't generate uh, too much violence and then further radicalization. Uh, these are all sort of strategic elements to uh, dealing with, a, with an insurgency. Um, but their armed forces are not structured in a way to, to fully address that. Um, they're, they're set up more for conventional warfare. Um, the doctrine that they, that they bide by is not really set up for a counterinsurgency strategy. Um, and, and so we've seen the many um, challenges that the, their armed forces have, have dealt with on the ground. And that's resulted in things like Mura uh, or other uh, instances in which you had uh, atrocities committed. Um, it's also resulted in some fairly embarrassing uh, losses, uh, I think, in the ground where um, what, what are perceived as ragtag teams of uh, guys with motorcycles have been able to overrun military bases, uh, or we can point to um, prior to the, the coup in Burkina Faso, I think it was in November 2021, uh, a gendarmerie base was completely overrun. And then it was discovered later uh, that they had been going without rations, without food, basic necessities uh, for several weeks uh, due to logistic failures within the, the armed forces there. Um, and so I think that um, I, I, I want to make a couple points here. One is that uh, I'd be more encouraged by the military juntas that have taken power um, if they were to step aside to civilian-led technocratic bodies um, that were able to address things like fiscal policy in a way that I think is probably uh, more competent than uh, how military officers would address it. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't better at managing the military, uh, and I understand those grievances. Um, and so from a strategic outlook, I would expect them uh, to be focused on how do we restructure. Um, and a key point, I think, is to understand that a security presence is needed uh, in these communities that are, are facing daily insecurity. 
Uh, and the force structure is not set up to provide that. There are not enough people on the ground, nor are they trained to do the types of uh, security practices that would help those communities. Um, the, the, the security uh, focus over the last several years has been on counterterrorism, special forces units uh, that are able to get in and get out uh, and, and predicated on a decapitation strategy of annihilating uh, insurgent leaders. Um, but that's not effective at providing security on the ground for communities that are regularly uh, facing threats by various armed groups, whether they be state sponsored or not. Uh, and, and so I think that this is a major concern is how to, how to restructure the armed forces so that you have an appropriate set of units um, to provide that security at the ground level. Um, and, and that's also a key tenet and service of government is security. Uh, and so perhaps if you could find an effective way to provide that security for communities that are in the so-called periphery, then perhaps that then yields positive uh, trust building mechanisms back towards the state and back towards government. Um, and I, I am uh, in no way suggesting that there is only one way to do that. Um, but I think that uh, from a, you know, putting on my, my other hat and trying to think like a, a Sahelian army officer, uh, that's, that has to be a, a key a key part of, of what my strategic interests are and how to achieve them. I'll Thank there. you, Dr. Daniel. Um, Dr. Dan, that was very, very um, well put together. Um, does anybody want to take the question about the awakening of African consciousness in the Sahel? I, I'm not quite sure I understand. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. So the question was, you know, with what we're, we're seeing, some people, some scholars have interpreted this as an awakening of African consciousness, um, you know, a, a rejection of Western standards and Western values, um, and a need to re-understand um, what's going on in, in the Sahelian context from an African perspective. That would be an optimistic statement um, that I can't quite subscribe to, but if I understand correctly, yeah. Um, anybody else? I think we had a question. Uh, I noticed in the chat that Dr. Mann, Greg Mann, I had uh, raised his hand. Oh, yes. Um, he's one of the, uh, one of the um, attendees. Is he still there? Yeah. Yes. Ah, and there he is, he's appeared. <laughs> Oh, hello. Hi, how are you? Are you? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been very illuminating, and I, uh, I'm glad to see, hear some people who are, and their thoughts and some people I didn't know. I, I just wanted to come in. It's maybe a little bit uh, past at the moment, but I appreciate what was being said from, from Bamako by uh, Ornella Modaran about uh, the question of what the proper position or stance of a researcher to take vis-a-vis -vis the military government uh, might be. I just want to pull out one other point, um, maybe for the consideration of, of, of the panelists, which is when we read and hear and, and talk about whether or not uh, these hunters are somehow legitimate or illegitimate political actors, I think we also need to consider the, the extreme degree to which the political class, at least in Mali, is um, currently discredited and, and seen as illegitimate. So when we think of the junta as possibly uh, an unacceptable partner or, 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 or actor or out of their space and in the political lane, they should be in the military lane and so on and so forth. I think we really have to bear in mind how completely, uh, the complete lack of faith in the political class to solve, to solve the problems, uh, how profound that lack of faith really is. That's all I want to say, thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, any other person want to add um, any last words? We have about five minutes before we wrap up. So I would give each of you about two minutes um, with your closing remarks. We can start with you, Dr. Leonardo. <laughs> Closing. Boy, that's a challenge. Uh, this has been such a rich discussion, and I really appreciate um, 
the, the various my various colleagues and the comments and uh, uh, Greg Mann's comment just now as well. I think we obviously have an, an extraordinarily complex situation here, and I think um, I, I actually don't know where to begin. I accept to say I would like to reiterate that this is this uh, this crisis. Um, we, we had this moment of collapse in March of 2012 of the Malian government that seemed to have cascaded this, but it's a long time coming. There's a long history of this. Um, I think if we look back at Mali in the in the in the two decades before then, uh, it, despite the fact of the sort of outside enchantment with the Malian democracy, um, Greg Mann's comment was relevant then. There was not much sense of legitimacy among the Malian population for that government, and it actually hadn't even been a very good democracy. It never had very good elections. If you maybe the very first ones in 1992, um, others were contested, and uh, Tete was just sort of everybody conceded it to him. You know, it was a long time coming, and if you look back even further and sort of follow, I think the trajectory we've had the the um, the the entire sort of the post-colonial trajectory uh, and much after the first decade or two of independence has been about weakening states and not strengthening them. If you start you know, speaking in very general terms, structural adjustment programs were all about removing the state uh, from certain sectors, removing state capacity, limiting state capacity. The enchantment was with the private sector that was going to do something. And when we got into the 1990s in democracy, there was this huge enchantment with the notion of NGOs. Dr. Mann has written very much about it. Of course, it starts much earlier, but the NGOization of the whole area. But of civil society as the alternative. Rather than the state, we're going to have private groups, civil society groups, etc. And I'm speaking in very, very general terms, but I think it's the point is that we've had a consistent series of efforts that have not attempted to build capable states on the ground with institutions capable of delivering services. There was something in somehow the idea that either private sector or individuals in these sort of civil associations were going to deliver these things. And there's not a substitute. And so um, this has been a long time coming. And uh, and the, the degeneration has been a failure that's sort of, there's a long time coming, but a failure of outside actors, a failure of internal capacity, and a downward cycle that I, out of which I, I think we have to recognize again, just to repeat what I said earlier, that this is not going away anytime soon. There's no military solution to this. It's gonna to have to be another long process of gradually attempting to rebuild some kinds of capable institutions for governance, whether they have to be a classic state um, in a Western model, I don't know, but we, you know, certainly people should be open to alternatives, but I don't know what they would be, but there has to be some kinds of methods of governance um, that, that and institutions at the at the at the local level because those have also the, the big tragedy I think of the last decade is that local institutions with all of their inequalities and you know, quite correctly pointed out to issues of hierarchy and class status and slavery etc in these regions nevertheless there were institutions that might have been just but they were functional but that managed to uh, to to mediate uh, some of uh, the, these tensions in ways that have now collapsed completely. Um, and how to rebuild them is, is not at all obvious. So I, I'm afraid I have no, um, I am befuddled despite having followed the region. And I think the only honest thing to say is I don't know uh, what the path forward is, um, but, it's, um, but it's certainly not, you know, looking back historically, we, there needs to be a change of strategy, change of approach. Thank you very much, Dr. Leonardo. Over to you, Tatiana, for your last comments. Yes, thank you so much uh, once again for this very rich discussion and so many, so many things that we can we can go on like to, to, to talk. So just maybe some some points that I wanted to to, to bring um, as concluding remarks. I think that it's really important to to think what the meaning of these military coups and uh, as it has been pointed out that these coups they emerged and they will continue maybe to emerge out of long years of kind of exclusionary politics whereby some communities find themselves systematically marginalized while others behave as kind of uh, 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 like owners of the state. And it's really, really important to keep in mind the, the meaning of this third wave of military coups. And, uh, and the second point I wanted to, 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 to bring is about the role of Russia in, in the Sahel. Um, I think it's really important to see that 
what Russia is offering is, is really different uh, from the West offering in terms of uh, different narratives. What kind of narrative Russia is offering is, it is another question, but what we see on the ground that it's, it's really, it's really, uh, it may lead to, to extremely controversial results. And uh, finally, I think, as I mentioned already, isolation of countries that engage with Russia would uh, probably lead to further destabilization. And I think it's also important thing to keep in mind. Yes, I'm done. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much, Tatiana. Over to you, Dan. Well, thank you, Jumo, and, uh, and and thanks again to all of our panelists. Uh, it's been a, a great discussion. I'm, uh, I feel I'm, I'm being bombarded a bit uh, uh, here with my pro-democracy pitch. Um, but uh, I guess what I'll say is that I am certainly not advocating that we make a return to Ibika's administration, uh, uh, you know, and completely recognize uh, that there are very legitimate grievances uh, against uh, the political establishment uh, by Malian citizens. Um, and I think that we, if we were to look around, there are very similar grievances in other Sahelian contexts. Um, and, uh, and I think that this is uh, something that we've known for quite a long time, that the, the political elite uh, in the Sahel um, are uh, deeply entrenched um, they, they have not really um, passed the baton. Um, in fact, I think that um, if we were to look at Niger up until uh, uh, President Bazoum was elected, um, you know, many of the same players had been running in elections in Niger since, since uh, the 1990s. Um, and, um, and so you have, I, I, I recognize um, uh, why there might be a, a deep distrust uh, uh, of, of political elites and the establishment, so to speak. Um, I, I still, though, don't believe that the military and power is a better alternative to a set of, of political institutions that are legally defined in a constitution um, in which there are processes by which citizens can engage and militate to change. Um, I find that to be, um, uh, in my mind at least, uh, easier and more conducive to projecting the interests of, uh, of citizens. Um, and so uh, I am a believer in uh, democratic peace theory and uh, democratic institutions. Um, I also welcome all of the variations that that should imply. Um, uh, I do not believe that democracy looks the same in every single country. Uh, in fact, it shouldn't. If it did, that would be a bad indication. It would suggest that democracy was not working uh, because countries are comprised of different components or different societies, different cultures, different interests. Uh, and so I, um, I, I think that long term, um, that that is the best for stability and security uh, writ large. Um, and I hope um, that my friends and colleagues in the Sahel um, uh, will, uh, you know, be able to 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 find that that kind of peace, uh, or that that kind of of, of um, uh, political system, uh, uh, that way to to uh, feel as though they can voice their interests and concerns. Uh, I guess is what I'm going for there. Is that I, I hope that they can find a forum in which they can express their own. Uh, their own interests and feel that those are taken into account. Um, and um, yeah, I think that that in the long term is going to be, uh, uh, that, that, that in the long term is uh, how we get to uh, uh, sort of peace and stability in the Sahel. So thanks. Thank you, Dr. Dan. And over to you last but not the least, Ms. Ornella for your last comments. Thank you very much. So um, much has been said already. So maybe I will just focus my final remarks on one key point looking forward, I think, which is, you know, the ability. And I guess this is for policymakers who are my um, number one constituency, I would say, but uh, also for, for, for the research communities that, um, the willingness to listen, even to listen to things that are uncomfortable to us that that don't sit well with the education that we got um and with with the values that that we hold and and i do believe that 
uh, the past 10 years of crisis in the Sahel, as well as uh, the current more immediate um, uh, series of, well, uh, of um, political crises around coups send us some very clear messages. Looking at the longer term, uh, 10 years old crisis now, secur security crisis, I think one of the elements we should be willing to listen to, and here I will, um, uh, go back to, to something Dr. Leo say, said in his closing remarks is, you know, there are local institutions um, that, that do work and perhaps we should be, or there needs to be a better acknowledgement of where power really sits, of the fact that, you know, institutions, formal institutions are not necessarily where things are happening. This is very clear when you look at the way, I don't know, um, uh, justice works in the uh, no northern part of Mali in the places where it does work. It's up, it has absolutely nothing to do with the state. It, 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 it has various uh, expressions in, in, in various places. But he also said that um, institutions may not be just, uh, local institutions may not be just, but they are functional. I think we should be careful about that. We know from history, um, several institutions that were functional for very long, but still agree are problematic. And if I want to be very provocative, I will say that slavery in the US was one, one of such, very functional. Doesn't mean it should be replied. Um, right replicated. So we need to um, acknowledge, I believe, that um, one of the root causes of the frustration that keeps feeding individual engagement into violent groups and so on is social injustice, is inequality, and that upholding uh, institutions that perpetuate that for the sake of, of stability will eventually lead to a relapse into uh, instability. And then my last point will be about this notion of, you know, to me, it's not so much about being pro or not pro democracy. It's it's what democracy means. From from a Sahel perspective, we have seen, and not just Sahel actually, but much of Francophone West Africa, we have seen for the past thirty years since the Discours de la Boule. So that that could even be well more more than thirty years now. Um, a kind of um, 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 well, the facade of democratic systems that really did not have. Um, have anything behind. So you would have elections, but then you would have bad governance, you would have corruption, you would have no access to, um, to basic education, uh, you would have state abuse and so on and so forth, which 30 years later, of course, leads to a situation in which now we are facing a, an entire generation that associates democracy with that. So the challenge, I believe, is to, to give democracy a new content, a new meaning, and in fact, to make it meaningful. Um, and, and that requires governance-based approaches, that requires consultative approaches, that requires also acknowledging that, um, um, well, specific countries may work from a very different value base that, uh, well, than the typical Liberian state. So I will close on this. Liber is not Malian, that's for sure. Thank you so much, Ms. Onella, for your um, final comments. I want to thank every one of you for joining us again. This was a very, as I said, engaging session that pushed us with our values and what we thought. And I'm very, very appreciative for our attendees and our panelists um, joining us um, this morning. I bid you farewell and I wish you a wonderful rest of um, the week. If Dr. Gomez has any final um, comments, I'll give the floor to him. Um, if not, I'm wishing you a blessed week. Thank you, Dr. Ayandele. Thank you all. Of, thanks to all of the panelists. This was um, really interesting. As I said before, I, I appreciate all of your comments. I think, Dr. Ayandele, we need to uh, uh, reconvene in the spring, maybe. Maybe we need to, maybe we need a conference. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, and maybe we can meet in person by then. Because uh, this is an extraordinarily important conversation. We, we're just, you know, uh, you know, we, 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 we're 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 just we're not getting into the into the meat of the discussion. Uh, you know, we're we're kind of uh, involved with the them with the thematics. I'd like to push it, you know, further if we could. So thank you so much to all the panelists. I look forward to. 
to following your work and and uh, perhaps we can reconvene in the spring inshallah i hope everybody has a wonderful day thank you dr ayandeli thank you